Welcome back, everyone, uh, to our first panel session of the day uh, with the name um, Triple Nexus in Practice. So, uh, as we have already mentioned today, um, during our research, the one number one complaint we have heard over and over again, especially from NGOs, was that while there is an intense debate and demand surrounding the Triple Nexus in, uh, on an HQ uh, headquarters and policy level, there was and still is very little knowledge and practical evidence-based advice on how to actually put it in practice. Um, this is the main reason why our CHAR research pillar is called the Triple Nexus in Practice and also um, this panel now is uh, called the same way. So I'm very happy uh, to introduce uh, today's speaker to you. We have uh, Reife Janke from Forum ZFD, Dr. Valo Schofisan from um, Inter the International Rescue Committee, uh, Carsten Noko from Médecins Sans Frontières and um, Caillou Orellana from Help Germany. Um, welcome to everyone. I'm very glad. Um, uh, uh, to open the, the first panel session with you. Um, and I have to say that already during the briefing calls to the session, we had such interesting and invigorating discussions on the Triple Nexus and the humanitarian system that I'm very much looking forward to our debate today. So um, to give you a, a bit of a heads up on what's going to happen, um, I will first engage with e each speaker individually for the first round of um, questions to um, spotlight um, their specific uh, experience and perspectives. After after that, we will have a second round uh, with some time for the panel to uh, discuss among each other uh, and then open up uh, to the audience. My colleague Darina will join me again um, on the stage later. Um, she will monitor the chat and uh, um, please again feel free to post questions and comments and engage very lively because it's also uh, very important to us um, not only uh, have this uh, close circle of experts inter uh, in interacting with each other, but um, we would really want to have the feedback of all the people registered. Um, for housekeeping, again, um, please mo uh, everyone who is not a speaker <laughs> at the, um, um, uh, in this particular session, please mute your mic and uh, turn off the camera. And, uh, for for any uh, technical questions, uh, please refer to the user CHA technical support. So, uh, welcome everyone. Let's start with Reife, Reife Janke. Um, she was born in, in Tur Turkey. Um, um, Reife Janke immigrated with her family to Germany at the age of 12. Um, her educa educational background is a lawyer. She worked in Tanzania for uh, the Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation and uh, the German GTZ in the field of good governance. Then uh, she has worked uh, for more than seven years for uh, the GITS uh, GIZ uh, Civil Peace Service in Afghanistan and in the Philippines. Based in Sinja, she worked also two years for the German NGO Welthungerhilfe on social cohesion and peace building measures in areas liberated from ISIS in northern Iraq where she was linking humanitarian with uh, peace building measures. Um, currently, she's the country director for uh, Forum ZFD in Iraq, uh, a German peace building organization focusing on um, conflict transformation measures and setting up the civil peace uh, service program in Iraq. So Reife is uh, joining us from Erbil uh, um, today. Um, there will be no video. Um, hello, Reife. Welcome. Can you please um, give us a brief description of uh, the work that your organization is doing in Iraq? Can you please, um, we cannot hear you at the moment. Turn on the mic on your computer. Okay, good morning, everyone. Here is Raifa. I'm sorry, we had a small technical problem. Good morning, Raifa. We're glad to have you. Thank you. Should I repeat my first question? Yes, please. I, okay. I'm sorry, I was... Okay, so um, the question was, if you could uh, be so kind to give us a brief description of the work that your organization, Forum ZFD, is uh, implementing in Iraq. Um, sure. Well, Forum ZFT, we call it also Forum Civil Peace Service in uh, English, is currently mm -hmm. setting up um, the German peace building program Civil Peace Service in northern Iraq. Um, with the focus of areas which were liberated from ISIS, those areas are um, the areas where lots of destruction took place and uh, millions of people were displaced all over Iraq. 
Well, this VLP service is a German governmental organization funded also by the German government itself, aiming to prevent violence and to promote peace in crisis zones and conflict regions in a nonviolent way. This is very important for us uh, to consider. Um, currently in Iraq, um, we are conducting an extensive context and conflict analysis, which will serve us as a baseline to set up our program in an effective way. Um, context and conflict analysis are uh, um, one of the main uh, components when we are um, doing our peace work generally. So since we are in the first setup of the um, program itself, the context and conflicts analysis will serve as a baseline um, to show us which areas are accessible for us, mm -hmm. which regions especially, and which entry points in terms of peace building um, can be taken in account for Forum Setecti or Forum Civil Peace Service. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Raif. And um, what is the, the definition of peace in your intervention? How you frame peace uh, in your work in Erbil and uh, the whole of Iraq? Well, we consider um, in our intervention actually the positive notion of peace. Mm -hmm. um, peace is um, a complex, long-term, multi-layered process of actually decreasing violence and increasing justice but in a non-violent way. I have to highlight that as well. Um, the multi-layered character means for us, not only governments, but also stakeholders at all levels of societies are responsible for it. Uh, so we consider how conflicts being solved. Um, it's about conflicts uh, being about solved in a constructive way in a society. We believe that peace exists where people are interacting in a non-violent, and are managing their conflicts positively. So this is the notion that we take um, if we implement intervention. That sounds uh, very interesting, all of it. Um, what are the challenges of, of, of this way of engaging with the problems? Well, uh, from my perspective, the main challenge is um, when we take in account the Iraq context and the peace building sector, um, that many organizations um, um, trying to, to implement the triple nexus by themselves. Many small scale and middle scale organizations without the core expertise starting um, to implement the triple nexus, especially also the peace building field itself. Here in Iraq, um, um, we were observing um, that um, unfortunately many, many humanitarian, especially humanitarian organizations were engaged in peace building without lack of know-how um, or true understanding of basic peace building concepts. Mm -hmm. um, there are no capacities and resources or well, less capacities and resources have been allocated in terms of mandate, in terms of personal and knowledge of proper peace building programming and approaches. Um, so these capacities are deficient and most of the time also unfortunately lacking if uh, most of the organizations started to implement um, peace building in the Iraqi context itself. Some humanitarian actors have been forced to implement peace building measures due to donor requests in often short time. Mm -hmm. This is another problem that we have to consider um, without proper planning and adequate consideration of the local context and the local dynamics and the conflict sensitivity. Here um, we were observing that um, main of most of the organization implementing peace building were claiming peace building sectors for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but they are rather inexperienced in developing and applying basic peace building approaches. Often they are lacking common understanding of, of approaches and terminologies, which from my perspective, especially as a peace builder, increases the risk of doing harm then. Uh, it might be happening unintentionally, uh, but it, it leads to more harm than um, yeah, to, to um, yeah, it leads to more harm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, on the other side, um, we were observing another challenge that we were observing the funding situation of the organizations where uh, most of the organizations had short-term funding and the funding was allocated to certain uh, to certain um, yeah, activities. Our funding, for example, is uh, uh, related only to peacebuilding measures. Um, also, we were observing that most of the humanitarian fundings were um, yeah, meant to be for humanitarian actions, mm -hmm. which is not really, um, promoting the Nexus approach itself. Um, the fundings are, especially the humanitarian fundings, are often very ring fenced to ensure it is used for humanitarian purpose, and they are one year for one year or very short term fundings, uh, which were leading um, to short term measures, so without considering sustainability of projects and approaches. So here we were observing most of the time when organizations started implementing peace building measures. It was either for half a year, even we had uh, uh, measures for, for three months or six months, and then afterwards, no uh, follow-up project were taking place. I think in another consideration that we, uh, or another observation that we made is that, uh, well, lack of coordination mm -hmm. between uh, the actors was um, not really, or the coordination itself was, was um, not really given. Um, many, many organ organizations were not able to share or to share less due to the competitiveness of the aid sector. So lessons learned, lessons learned were either hesitantly shared or not really shared. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to say here, highlight is um, that especially um, overall, I think if especially small scale or middle scale organizations start, especially humanitarian from the humanitarian sector, start to implement peace building actions or peace building measures. Um, a more collaboration has to be given and also coordination has to be also a point we have to consider. We can all learn from each other, I think, even we peace actors from the humanitarian actors. Um, but on the other side, I will really highlight that um, coordination, collaboration, learning from each other is a way to promote the approach itself. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting plea and also connecting uh, uh, what our keynote um, has uh, designated earlier with actually evidence uh, from, from your daily work. Um, I have a last question to you relating to something that has been mentioned already as well, um, the relationality between um, peace activities and um, state actors and uh, non-state actors. So um, what is uh, ZFD's standing vis-a-vis -vis local authorities and communities? Um, do you have well, partnerships with other organizations as well? So ZFD um, um, main approach is uh, partner-centered. Uh, or CPS uh, approach is partner-centered. We implement generally with local structures, with local partners. Um, our um, also experts, we have um, experts who are sitting in the partner organization trying to strengthen the uh, local structures. Um, so the, the, the partner-centered approach and the community-based approach is um, very important for CPS itself. Um, we try to, yeah, the structures of corporations uh, at different level, engaging the local structures and partners. Um, yeah. And partnership with other organization, um, we do, um, I can speak here from forum ZFD point of view. Um, we do have also partnership relationship with other organizations, especially with humanitarian organizations currently in other countries where we are engaged in Lebanon and Philippines. Um, we are working with other humanitarian organizations uh, to come up with conflict sensitive planning and programming. Mm -hmm. um, these are the partnerships we are currently considering and Forum ZFT itself is very much open for that. 
Thank you, Ralf, um, for um, letting us uh, have a little uh, bit of an insight into your daily work. Um, please, uh, dear audience, dear uh, online audience, uh, feel free to uh, post questions and comments. We will come back later. For now, I would like to move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Vale Oshofisan. He is a senior director of the Governance Technical Unit at the International Rescue Committee. He leads the unit's team of senior advisors, uh, technical advisors and specialists overseeing program support to over 30 IRC country offices. Vale has uh, two decades of professional experience researching and working on humanitarian development and conflict prevention and peace building issues. Um, prior to joining the IRC, he has worked with Plan UK, Help Age International UK and the UNDP Nigeria in various roles from um, technical assistance uh, to research and evidence, policy influencing and advocacy. Vale holds a PhD in post-war recovery studies from the Department of um, Politics uh, at the University of York in the UK. Um, vale, I'm very happy to have you with us today. So. Um, the IRC has implemented a series of um, Triple Nexus projects so far. Um, could you highlight some um, of the projects and maybe include IRC's um, specific take on peace? Um, thank you, Andrea. Can, can you hear me well? I can hear you very well. Right. Thank you so much. And thank you to uh, thank um, CAHA as well for inviting IRC to be part of this um, conference, um, whose timing, I believe, couldn't have come at any better time, given the fact that um, if there's one key lesson the aid sector can learn from COVID, it is one that tells us that um, an effective response to a pandemic is not just purely a humanitarian, a development or peace building affair. Um, the fact is that it is all three. So surely we can save lives while simultaneously developing um, you know, walk around building effective and responsive health systems and making sure that um, we do so in ways that promote uh, peace. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to your question on IRC's take on, on peace, so for us at the IRC, we really do not consider humanitarian development and, and peace building as mutually exclusive activities. Um, having said that though, our approach to peace always bears in mind that peace building activities can be either categorized as negative peace or positive peace, which um, uh, Raif responded to um, earlier on um, in, in, a, in a response to one of your questions. You know, so negative peace referring to the absence of physical violence, mm -hmm. while positive peace focuses on tackling structural violence, such as inequalities, deep-seated grievances, human rights abuses, gender-based violence, social injustices, exclusion of certain groups from decision-making processes, as well as weak public and conflict management um, institutions and organizations. So for us at the IRC, we take the position that the search for positive peace should always go beyond just stopping the act of violence, but actually understanding and putting to an end the very conditions that make violence um, attract, uh, an attractive form of resolving um, conflict. So how do we actually do this? We try to design program activities with the intention to remove or gradually, you know, if you like, uh, chip away the drivers of violent conflicts in ways that enable us to contribute um, to peace. So I'll give you a practical example. We are right now in the final year of implementing a Sweden CEDA funded conflict prevention and peace building program in Democratic Republic of the Congo and Somalia, which was deliberately designed with positive peace in mind. Mm -hmm. So in DRC, we are using equitable access to health services between two conflicting groups, the Bantus and the Twas in Tanganyika province. And we are also using access to justice services in two districts in Mogadishu, Karen and Awadag district um, in, in Mogadishu, as entry points to promoting um, you know, positive peace. So, okay. Now, the choice of access to health in Tanganyika and access to justice in Mogadishu was based on an initial context and conflict analysis mm -hmm. that we conducted prior to the design of the program. Uh, I was, you know, very pleased to hear um, Rife, you know, talk about using context and conflict analysis as a baseline to inform the design 
of um, you know our organization's programs because I've I've heard you know in some instances where peace building projects are being designed not informed by any context or conflict analysis and it makes one one wonders you know without understanding the context and the conflict how on earth can you um, implement implement an effective peace building program. Mm -hmm. Thank you for for uh, uh, sharing that with us. So, um, on the specific capacities that are needed for successful intervention, um, what have you learned from the projects in DRC and uh, Somalia? So, uh, mm. in addition to what Raifa has just mentioned, or maybe. Um, um, okay. So, in, in terms of capacities, I, I will say for sure that you need a team that have the skills to do three things. Mm -hmm. One is, again, I go back to context and conflict analysis, you know, to inform not just the initial design of the project, but also continuously updating the analysis on a periodic mm -hmm. basis as they may need to adjust their strategies and activities because context does change, right? So what you designed six months ago might be irrelevant if the context changes six months later. So you have to keep updating your context and conflict analysis. And this, this is so key and it's so foundational. So your team need to be able to do those types of analysis on a regular basis. The second thing I'll, I'll say that you need is good facilitation, negotiation, and mediation mm -hmm. skills. Because it, 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 effective local level community peace building requires all three. And it, it is a must that this has to be locally driven. It mm -hmm. is so critically important and um, that you know it has to be locally owned. The, the third um, capacity I would like to flag, although this is not necessarily a capacity from an implementing organization's point of view, but it is so important, I think is worth flagging. You need a donor that is flexible and supports adapt, adaptive management. And, and if I may, I would like to you know, um, commend um, the Peace and Human Security Unit in CEDA as a fantastic model example based on our you know, IRC's positive experience co-designing and implementing the conflict prevention and peace building um, project I mentioned earlier in DRC and, and Somalia. I mean, without the flexibility and ability to put into practice adaptive management, it would have been so difficult, especially in Somalia, where the context kept changing. So we have to keep, mm -hmm. you know, um, keep up, you know, readjusting our activities, readjusting our strategies to meet the specific crisis at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vala, also for, for pointing out to uh, the need for negotiation and, and diplomacy, because I, I think this is something that always kind of falls uh, off the table in a way. And um, you're the third person today, or the third f person except us at the chair mentioning the lack of donor flexibility. I would just like to mention to the audience uh, who might not uh, have a, an idea about the whole program, but we will dive into that from the last session today over the uh, uh, two sessions tomorrow, we will have donors present and ask them what is going on there. So um, I have one short uh, question uh, for you again, uh, Vale, and that kind of refers to what you have touched upon already, um, um, the question of uh, local ownership. You have mentioned um, how you design your conflict analysis. Um, who is actually, how, how, how do you make sure that, um, that, that, that um, local ownership is not just a, a buzzword, but um, is kind of put into practice in your interventions? Uh, thanks, Andrea. Um, you know, for sure. I mean, for, for us at the IRC, um, we always design and implement peace activities with local partners in the driver's seat. And this is so important for several reasons. You know, one is local ownership. Two is legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Three is moral authority. Well, in, in, so, in some cases. Um, and four, you know, perception of fairness. And they also know the terrain you know, more than an external organization could. Mm -hmm. They know who needs to be at the table. They know who the key stakeholders are. So in terms of how it works for us, we also use um, our outcomes and evidence framework as a guide. This is an online platform where we have our programmatic theories of change and the state of the evidence around five outcome areas which we focus on at the ILC. These are health, education, economic well-being, mm -hmm. safety, and power. So for projects with peace activities, we draw on safety and power outcome areas to inform the initial design, but mm -hmm. also drawing on, and this is very important as well, drawing on and tailored to the findings of the context and conflict analysis I flagged um, um, earlier. 
Um, now, I think it's, it's worth you know, mentioning that you know, given we are a service delivery organization, we use services, health, education, protection, and justice services as entry point um, to promote um, positive peace, as you know, we are currently doing in um, you know, several projects right now. We also use um, live news and economic programming as well as entry points where we can identify joint economic programming activities um, you know, with local um, businesses, um, you know, activities that can, you know, that can be of benefit to both um, conflicting um, communities. And, and as I speak you know, to you and um, at this conference now, our team in Somalia is working on the concept where we aim to promote multi-sectoral triple nexus interventions to deliver and develop um, community resilience. Okay. How we approach the triple nexus, but all of it is rooted in local ownership because it will not work if the communities don't own the process. Okay, thank you so much, Vale, for this very hands-on insight into your work. We will come back uh, to you and the others later when uh, we start the second round. For now, I would uh, like to turn to Carsten. Um, Carsten Noko is a humanitarian aid worker from Zimbabwe. He has worked in Nigeria, South Sudan and Afghanistan with the humanitarian sector, both in advocacy and policy, as well as in program management for the past 11 years. Like Reife, he is a lawyer by training and is currently uh, studying towards an LLM and human rights law. Um, a very warm welcome from my side to you, uh, Carsten. Uh, he's joining us from uh, Kabul, if I'm not uh, mistaken today, and um, a warm welcome. So uh, you're working for uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF. Uh, it's an actor mm, quite notoriously known to be a very principled humanitarian actor, actor. and um, especially in the uh, Triple Nexus debate, an actor critical of the Triple Nexus and um, its potentials to blur the lines of mandates and principles. So um, how does peace um, actually feed into your work in regions affected by violence and war? Um, thank you, and, and thank you so much for, for hosting um, um, this, this very important uh, discussion. Um, indeed, I mean, listening to, to uh, Wallace speak about uh, um, the reflections of the IRC and the work that they do, um, it is very difficult for, for anyone to, to argue with him, um, um, because precisely because there is no reason to. Um, the, the, the context uh, analysis that he, he refers to, um, which is very important, is a key element in, in all of the work that we do in conflict areas. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, really, the, the, the question is, of course, we do need um, a, a, an outlook that takes into consideration the drivers of conflict and um, And, and how development works um, in, in, and, and fits into that kind of, um, um, of work. Um, but at the end of the day, and I mean, the, the question always goes to how then do we actually do this? Um, what, what is the practical um, experience, uh, field experience that we are seeing since um, the, the humanitarian development and peace nexus um, has been implemented. And, and here I speak about my experiences in, in Nigeria, which was one of the pilot projects um, in terms of, of the nexus. Um, and, and, and what we see is the, the struggle of, of deciding, you know, um, uh, how, how do we do this and, and who is actually responsible for deciding how to um, to frame projects, and I think someone speaks very well, um, including Wale himself, about um, the, the 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 mandate of donors and, and how they drive policy and, and and projects that we see on the ground. Um, and I think it's an important reflection to have um, on how they they uh, feed in and influence um, the the success or, or or failure of of the nexus in practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carsten, um, for that. Um, in our briefing calls, we have talked a lot also about challenges. What are the concrete challenges um, that you could identify in your work with regard to the triple nexus? It, in, indeed, I think uh, I think w some of the key challenges that we see in terms of, of practical implementation for me starts at who actually decides um, which part of the nexus to implement. Um, and how to implement it. We have seen this being um, 
um, a very difficult subject, especially when um, you know humanitarian response plans are drafted and 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 who's responsible for for the policy direction. So we start to see challenges from that level. Um, but also, it, it, I think. We, we are. We should also remember that we don't work in a bubble. So we have uh, this external environment, external to um, to NGOs um, and and humanitarian and development actors. And and here I talk about the states where we are working. I talk about uh, the conflict areas and the drivers of conflict and um, the people who are participating in conflict. Um, and and I think that. Uh, more and more we see that um, NGOs, broadly speaking, um, um, continue to be accused as, as, uh, as agents of, of state agenda. Mm -hmm. um, we see in, in places, again, going back to Nigeria, where um, we, there's been accusations that uh, um, NGOs are, and, and I'm talking about about two months ago, a very uh, now infamous Al Naba editorial referring to, to this uh, that NGOs are drivers of state policy and, and they help the state um, maintain these uh, um, uh, uh, concentration camps, as they call them. Um, and, and I think that it is an important reflection to have on, on what then is the space of, of NGOs vis-a-vis um, -vis the work that they have to do. Um, there are serious questions that, that do arise regarding um, impartiality. Um, mm -hmm. Outside of that, we also see the concern about, about security of staff. And I have to be very specific here that I talk about both national staff and international mm -hmm. staff. Um, for those of us who follow what is happening in the, in the Sahel um, and the, the operations there, we, we do know that uh, more and more humanitarian um, staff are getting, um, and actually NGO staff are getting more and more into danger because of accusations of working um, for one party of the conflict. So it, it has security concerns for staff, but also for the operations that these staff are trying to, to implement and whatever services that they're trying to, to, to render to, to the populations. Um, and again, also related to this, we, we see this uh, interesting dynamic that whereas um, non-state armed actors continue to accuse NGOs of, of working in um, um, and, and trying to feather the agenda of the state. On the other end, we see the state actually also reasserting itself and, and uh, accusing NGOs of, of delivering aid or assistance to, to people who should not be receiving aid, mm -hmm. um, to people who are considered to be terrorists. We, we start to see more and more in, in, in contracts that, uh, that, that donors ask NGOs to sign, uh, being very specific that um, um, there are some people who should not be receiving assistance. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it, it brings into question then, how then do we work when uh, more and more we are getting squeezed from, if I can call it both sides, so the side of the state, mm -hmm. but also the side of, of the non-state armed actors. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pointing that out, uh, Carsten. I would like to take the chance to also promote one of our papers that has just been published. It kind of touches upon uh, and that uh, issue with the example of uh, Pakistan, and it kind of lays out, uh, as uh, my uh, colleague Raif has already mentioned, uh, the um, relationship between uh, triple nexus activities and the, and, and the state and um, in Pakistan is authored by my colleague uh, Sonia. My last question to you, um, Niger uh, um, 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 Carsten, is uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about your work in Nigeria and how your concrete experience uh, with regards to the conflict environment and MSF has been in Nigeria. The, the, the conflict in Nigeria continues to be a, a very big challenge, not only for MSF, but uh, if I can say almost the entire um, um, NGO sector, if, if I can call it that. Um, we continue to, to face problems um, as we try to, to create space, so um, so-called humanitarian space um, continues to shrink because we, we have all of these uh, uh, um, uh, powers, if I can call it that, uh, squeezing more and more and restricting more and more the ability of, of, of humanitarian aid workers, um, but also uh, development actors to actually do work that they're supposed to be doing. Uh, I speak of, of garrison towns in, in, uh, in Northeast Nigeria that mm -hmm. since 2016, people have been struggling for basic needs as shelter and water. Um, the solutions that we have are um, uh, constitute of us, uh, you know, 
um, uh, building up dams that, uh, that that people will use. And this was the same discussion from four years ago now, and still people still struggle to have access to water, particularly in the dry season. Um, and 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 yes, when we talk of of, of provision of water as an example, yeah. um, and its importance in health, not only in health but in in every aspect of of life, um, and when people continue to struggle to have access to water for four years because the solution that is required um, involves building a dam that will uh, take years to construct, but in actual fact, the site of the dam is in a um, in an area controlled by the non-state armed actors. Mm -hmm. So how then do you, uh, so they, there is this um, uh, feeling of, of, of being trapped really uh, and failing to, to provide very basic services because of the environment that we continue to find ourselves in. Thank you, um, Carsten, for, for highlighting um, those particular aspects that, uh, um, 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 aspects that also relates to the, the to, to the framework I think that that we are operating in with regard to the trip and access this dire protractedness of crisis you have mentioned you know four years ago it was this ten years ago it was like that and um, there seems to be uh, not much change going on uh, but maybe we discuss this later uh, uh, among uh, the four of us I would now like to uh, um, engage uh, with uh, Kayu as our uh, um, final speaker for today. Um, Kayu Orellana is a humanitarian policy officer and the head of the new Berlin office of the German NGO, INGO Help, Hilfe zur Selbsthilfe e.V. He has been working for help uh, since 2016 with uh, changing duty stations, starting as a project manager in Syria and later as project coordinator and team leader for the MENA region at the Help HQ in Bonn, Germany. He is a guest lecturer at the Command and Staff College of the Bundeswehr, the German Armed Forces, uh, on uh, topics such as civil mil military cooperation. And he is also HELP's representative at the German Humanitarian Coordination Assembly. He has studied um, Latin American studies at the Freie Universität Berlin and emergency and disaster management at Tel Aviv University. Kayu, uh, we are very glad to have you here. Um, your organization, hi. <laughs> Your organization is involved in uh, many regions of conflict, so um, you have also coordinated the intervention in Syria. Um, in what ways is HELP uh, getting involved with peace activities? Right. So um, thanks for having me and thanks for having HELP as an organization in uh, your panel, uh, first of all. Good morning and thanks to the um, like co-panelists uh, at the moment for their great input. Well, okay. Um, I'm working um, mostly on Syria issues, so I think this is a very, very problematic example for peace work, uh, especially when it comes to um, the involvement of NGOs, since the legitimacy of NGOs and the legitimacy of different state and non-state actors is like uh, highly complicated and um, sometimes also difficult to explain. So what we're trying to do is, I think uh, I would like to to um, add to a point that Wale said uh, before, uh, we I think the, there are two layers of what we're trying to do and also what a lot of other NGO colleagues are trying to do in Syria is uh, um, we're trying to go over the um, the way of providing services, like because the availability of services is a, a key factor for some level of stability. And I think in the, the example of Syria, we are at such a low level of um, like uh, of quality of life situation, availability of service situation, depending a little bit on the region where you're working, that this is actually where you have to start with. And I do not see a lot of space for us, especially in this uh, in this particular conflict environment, um, to start major um, and exclusive peace activities. What I think is um, that peace comp or actually that peace should be at least for us when it comes to conflict uh, scenarios should be a method of or a way to mainstream a topic into other activities so we're we're all in um, we are in very clear humanitarian activity activities for example when it comes to distribution of hygiene uh, items 
um, or when it or in a development field where it comes to rehabilitation of key infrastructure like water infrastructure but um, there should be um, like maybe also additional effort to mainstream peace questions when it comes to language when it comes to different factors into existing in a existing activity portfolio that's what I think how we approach things so um, we are not very sure at the moment if we could like do exclusively like pretty much separate peace activities that are exclusively that in Syria mm -hmm. right now. Thank you for this. Um, would uh, partnerships be an option uh, to engage maybe more uh, specifically in peace activities with your organization? Well, the question is if we want to do that, really, because uh, we have nothing against uh, partnerships, don't get me wrong, because we're also working with a, with a network of local partners in Syria as well. But um, the question is, do we see the sense of that because the question is really so no no doubt that uh, that peace and especially positive peace is a very important thing and something that ngos can somewhat contribute to but um, there's always the question for smaller and middle-sized ngos if this is actually something that they can do with the capacities they have right so if mm -hmm. i do not have a department on my hand that is actually dedicated to working with peace activities um, then the question is how am i supposed to do that um, am i supposed to learn this because i I really don't think that this is something that we can make uh, happen just like that in a very short time, because you need a lot of, uh, first of all, you need like an extensive conflict analysis, as we said before, then you need to know what you're doing there, right? So um, Reif, a very, very important comment from her was uh, that um, there are a lot of NGOs that are because of whatever externality forced to implement peace activities, but they don't really know what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So, and they actually do more harm through that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into this situation. So um, this is also why we're saying we're sticking to what we think can contribute also to some level of stability. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm saying stability, not peace at the moment, through the provision of services. Mm -hmm. um, right. Where would you see the difference between stability and peace while we're at it? Well, yeah, I think it's um, that when, when we're talking about a conflict scenario, then peace would be a positive addition to mm -hmm. the context, right, to the scenario. When I'm talking about stability, uh, I'm trying to to uh, prevent a deterioration of, the, con of mm -hmm. the situation. I think this is maybe the difference. One is in addition, one is just a maintaining a certain level of... Uh, Upholding the, the status quo yeah, in a way. Right, right, okay, right. thank you very much. And uh, something that we have uh, uh, encountered a lot during uh, our own research and also our engagement with other um, with other NGOs and 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 researchers was um, the question if. Um, there is an articulated demand at all from the side of, of, of the communities you serve, from the affected populations, for the NGOs to get involved in peace activities. This is something that um, um, we have found a lot uh, during our research. Um, did something like this happen to you while you are, for example, um, coordinating uh, programs in, in, in Syria? Are those right, events look. Happening, yeah, so this 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 happens, but this is not something where you where somebody is coming to you and sending you a big letter and telling you, listen, this is now our official request that we demand from you. You know, this is something these, these small little things that are happening in the everyday business where where you see opportunities to actually do some, let's say, mediation. For example, when it's uh, when it's when you're in a, working in a camp environment, and uh, for example, the camp management is in some problem with whatever a supplier or people mm. who are living in the camp or whatever. These are the things where you can contribute like on a small scale. But I tell you again, this is not based on some uh, major study when it comes to conflict analysis or something. This is more, this is more happening every day, you know, uh, mm -hmm. between our staff, between our partners, staff and the people who are involved. And one thing that I would also like to add is, and we had this in the pre-discussion with Wale as well, he said it, it's and I we're going to repeat that, um, the separation of the different um, the separation of the different working fields like humanitarian aid development uh, and uh, peace and we didn't even touch and i saw this in the chat we didn't even touch the security nexus and the environmental protection nexus mm -hmm. we didn't even touch that so but here um this is like an artificial separation of uh things and in the reality you know outside of the academic discourse um this is called the life of the people <laughs> we are working with mm -hmm. because the life is like so complex and so different and all these factors are influencing um the life of people at the end of the day so nothing to be really separate but the question is really like to what extent we try to use different tools to mm -hmm. um, improve or stabilize other people's lives 
Thank you, Kayu. Kayu. I think this is a very um, um, good starting point for our uh, um, common discussion right now. Um, before we uh, jump right into it, I would uh, remind everyone, um, I, I hear you, I, I don't see the uh, chat at the moment myself. I hear you uh, saying that there is a lot going on at the moment uh, already, but I would like to um, encourage uh, more participation um, at this point, and uh, later we will um, um, refer to the questions in the chat. So, um, um, Kayu, you have now uh, pointed out to the fact that uh, one of the main problems with the with the triple nexus is the um, artificial um, um, separation of isolated silos. Uh, it has been mentioned in this session. It has been mentioned before. Um, to all of you, uh, what, 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 what steps do you think are needed to engage in a more holistic vision of intervention? Um, whoever wants to go first, uh, maybe we kind of try to um, have an engaged, uh, but a little bit orderly discussion. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Vale, we cannot hear you. Uh, no. Okay. Maybe someone else would like to go first until we figured out what's going on. Yeah, I can. I can. Oh, now he's done. Now he can. Okay. Do it. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I needed someone um, at the back end, you know, to um, on mute me. Uh, so there was a question by Patrick in, in in the chat, which I think goes to what you you, you were saying, um, Andrea. What needs to be done? In, in my view, what I see is the conversation around the triple nexus is happening at the global level, and when it gets down to the country level, is happening at the capital city as well. What I will say is that you can actually think about the triple nexus, even from the community level, where organizations such as mine, you know, IRC, implement programming. So, you know, it, 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 it goes back to the conundrum of, you know, when people talk about, when a lot of humanitarians talk about development, what comes to mind is working with the ministry, working with the central government. Yes, that's part of it. But you can also do development work at the community level. You can actually do development work at the facility level, the health facility, schools, you know, working with um, school heads, parent teachers association, um, working with um, midwives, um, you know, clinicians, that's also development work. So triple nexus can also happen at the community level. It doesn't necessarily have to be only at the policy level. That's one, I think um, I'll probably say error that we see in terms of the conceptualization of the triple nexus. Let's take it down, you know, to where people are. And one other thing I, I want to say, as I was listening to um, other panelists um, and, you know, having been involved in this triple nexus space for a while now, you know, the, the key focus for us should be about outcomes, outcomes for people, right? You know, <laughs> Triple Nexus, you know, forgive me for, for saying this, it's, it's, it's meaningless if it doesn't bring about positive change to the lives of people. I mean, people don't wake up in the morning and say they're going to have humanitarian aid for breakfast or they will have um, development assistance for lunch. Oh, I might think about peace building for dinner. You know, the people we serve don't, that's not the way they live their lives. These are structures that we've created in the aid system and architecture, which is fine. But as long as whatever we're doing is focusing on measuring real outcomes and impact for the people we serve, mm -hmm. we'll be in a better place. Thank you, Vale. Um, Kayu, you uh, wanted to go? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to jump in, but I can actually do a uh, follow up now. So uh, I would like to echo what Wale just said. And I would also uh, emphasize that there is there's, uh, also a lot of, I think, uh, another thing where we could uh, make some progress is uh, is actually to clarify a few things. For example, when we have established uh, peace uh, organizations that are dedicated to working with peace activities, then I think this could be a major benefit to all of us if um, 
we could uh, learn more from them when it comes to how to mainstream uh, peace activities. And this is also what I'm ad advocating for, is um, since there's a, there are a lot of NGOs that do not have the capacity or knowledge to work uh, like specifically in peace uh, components, then we because we all just learned about do no harm, that's uh, as far as it gets and um, maybe there is a chance to distribute more to also to echo more what peace or actors are mm -hmm. doing and mm -hmm. this is maybe how we could how we could improve but i think also there's one thing i think there's always always one bitter, bigger thing than positive peace and that's actually the absence of the soul of the negative peace because if there's armed conflict going on um what am i supposed to do you know as i mean it's like for example let's take syria right so um when you when let's take the northeast of Syria, right, where you have the Kurdish self-administration, um, with uh, uh, occasional visits from the Turkish army and their uh, their uh, their friends. So the question is really, um, there is like a split. For example, when you look at the situation where where now it wasn't in news, maybe you've read it that um, the the Kurdish self-administration released like, like a, a large number of uh, prisoners that were affiliated with the Islamic State, right? And then, um, like the outcry on media was big, and they said, "Oh, this is going to destabilize." And even our colleagues in the in the field are saying that this is destabilizing the situation. Da 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 da. da. Okay, but the question is really. Um, but the reason for this was that there is a huge uh, number of different, uh, very influential clans in the northeast of Syria, and those they have clans members that were in, uh, imprisoned because they were following the Islamic State back then, right? So, but this is actually a piece, a trick mm -hmm. from the Kurdish administration to try to appease the situation, which is always very tense between the clans and the Kurdish self-administration to release a number of uh, political or uh, war prisoners to um, get the situation more quiet in the northeast of Syria. So the question is, is this a, is, is this a, a, a good governance move or not? Because mm -hmm. we are also observing, and this is what we had also in the pre-discussion, we're observing that a lot of um, stabilization or peace depends a, a lot on the trust or trust of the population to the local government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is this, is this a trust building move, yes or no? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an open question. Uh, um, we are talking. We are going to talk about a trust a little bit uh, later. I would now like to come back to your earlier point, um, um, Kayu, This idea of uh, learning from each other. Rafa, you have mentioned it already uh, in, in 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 your introduction, and maybe also Carsten uh, could jump in in terms of what um, what are the limits and the opportunity of learning from each other. What does this actually mean? Do we need more fora? Do we need more coordination among actors? And um, yeah, what are the benefits of it? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very difficult and, and, and loaded question at that. Um, and, and yet um, an extremely important one. Um, I think that uh, for, for many of us who've been working in this space, so in whatever space, whether humanitarian or development or peace uh, or peace building um, activities, we know that these uh, silos, if, as we call them, have, have their inherent problems. So we've had problems for, for decades. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that what, what we need to be mindful of as well is as we try to learn from each other and bring all of these things together, but we're also multiplying and adding on the problems that we have been facing in our different silos. And, and so instead of, of, of this being, uh, you know, broken down into smaller sizable chunks, we actually make a big mountain out of it and, and it becomes more and more difficult to implement. I mean, I think as, as, as Wale was saying, you know, let's, yes, let's bring things to the community level, yes. But at this moment, the people who, who actually write up policy and us as practitioners mm -hmm. are discussing the difficulties of this. And, and we, are, we are not finding solutions that allow us to implement activities mm -hmm. um, as easily. And, and now we then want to, to bring it down to local level because, mm -hmm. well, we, we, we think, yes, that will help bring about solutions. But in actual fact, what does it mean when when we are failing as practitioners to actually find common ground, and now we want to bring this to the community level, um, how does that actually work in practice is, mm -hmm. is, is basically my question. And, mm -hmm. and I wish I had an answer for yeah. it. Alea, uh, I don't. I understood your first comment a little bit like um, the idea of getting your own house together before uh, trying to uh, meet the others, if yes. I understood yes. you right. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, Raife, maybe you want to um, follow up a little bit on, on the discussion? 
Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think how far we can learn from each other. Well, this is the um, uh, peace builder angle now. Um, please don't forget that. I think if it's come to the humanitarian organizations or organizations who started to implement peace building measures, first of all, it's uh, as said already in the previous um, speeches, um, the mainstreaming of conflict sensitive planning and programming, considering that um, taking the local context and dynamics in account is, is a step to come together. Here, I think um, we all actors can share analysis and we can share um, the, the risk of vulnerabilities, the root causes of, of the conflict. Um, this will be an important step towards increased coherence among the actors um, and maybe also support collaborative efforts if it's come to the nexus, uh, the triple nexus. On the other side, I think the peace building actors could be consulted by organizations which start to implement peace building um, measures um, yeah, um, to, to plan and um, yeah, also implement in a conflict sensitive way. Mm -hmm. Here, the development uh, actors especially could rely on the experience of the experience of the peace building actors. Instead, I think throwing together their own rough and ready solutions. Um, this is another way to come together. Um, and here, a cooperation could take place. But I think another uh, way to come together to collaborate or to promote um, local structures is, are the local capacities at national and local level. There, I think, um, especially organizations who are working in conflict affected areas like in Iraq, mm -hmm. where capacities are very weak, where um, civil society organizations were popping up after the crisis itself uh, from 2014 on and are not able to implement activities or even demand budgets from international dollar, donors because the structures are missing. Mm -hmm. There, I think all actors can come together and um, try to strengthen this local capacities and uh, mm -hmm. initiatives in a way where we can coordinate, collaborate, and where um, also the local capacities and local structures can benefit. I think this is another way how we can come together as well. And also this is in the best interest of the people you serve. This is kind of what yes. uh, binds all, all uh, of your comments already. Um, I would now like to, to, to uh, jump to the next uh, point. Uh, something that also relates to what we uh, have just discussed, but um, going a little bit uh, deeper into uh, the matter at hand. Um, during our briefing courts, um, our discussion on the triple nexus uh, kept coming back to the question of the relationship between the um, institutional frameworks that we have already mentioned again and the dignity actually of affected populations, um, as well as uh, a potential Western uh, bias of uh, the specific peace lands in, in the triple nexus. Um, would you mind uh, sharing um, your thoughts on that that we have discussed earlier uh, uh, um, this week uh, around those very relevant and timely questions that kind of also were they are solemnly mentioned in triple nexus de debates? What about um, this, uh, the, this uh, Western perspective on, on peace and the triple nexus? What about actually uh, being mandated by the people uh, to actually uh, focus on the dignity of affected populations? Go for it. You're all smiling. <laughs> I, I, I can I can go first. Um, go thanks, thanks, Andre. I mean, for 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 us, when we talk about humanitarian action and and providing uh, life saving assistance, um, mm -hmm. what we try to do is to 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 do exactly that to put patients at the very center of of, of the actions that we do. We try to to refrain as much as possible from, as I was mentioning earlier, about how um, when when you are um, are working within the HDN uh, nexus, uh, HDP nexus, sorry, you're actually looking at 
um, um, more and more accusations of us working to further state agenda or to further um, the agenda of, of this or that other party. And, and what we are trying to do is actually exactly that. Let's bring this back to the, um, at least for the, for, in, in MSF's uh, respect, for, for the patient. So how then do we provide assistance that speaks to the needs of the patient um, and not so much to worry about um, how do we fit into this institutional framework? And, and I think that the more and more we try and, and bring the, the discussion and, and frame it in that way, I think we, we start to see then the, the, the difficulties of, of the nexus and, and how, mm. how do you try and, and bring assistance to your patient, but also trying to, to drive this uh, policy framework that, that requires you to have a, a certain view of, of, of how to address um, the malaria that the patient faces, or um, it is a, a woman who's com coming to give birth at the, at the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, how does that fit into the very practical um, um, aspect that, that people um, require as assistance from us on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Carsten. Um, I can come in as well here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Andrea, to, to your question on, on you know, the institutional frameworks that we're trying to fit peace into, and um, how do we reconcile that with dignity um, of beneficiaries? I think I will approach that in three ways. One is maybe what we need to do is move away from you know a purely needs-based approach okay. to a rights-based approach mm -hmm. to programming. That's one. The second is you know we also need to think about moving away again from you know, power over the people we serve to power weight. So we're doing, um, you know, things um, with them. You know, and the other thing is, you know, it is related to the power over and, you know, power weight. Are we doing things to people or are we doing things with people? Are we recognizing the agency of people? So it's not just us coming from Western capitals designing interventions in London, in New York, in Geneva, in Berlin, and sending it to our colleagues in the field to implement. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're doing? Or are we actually co-designing the intervention with the very people that the intervention will benefit? Mm -hmm. Because they understand the context, they know what the issues are. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'll marry that with the evidence of what works globally, mm -hmm. but adapted to the context. So for me, it's about um, power, as, as I mentioned earlier, we use our safety and power outcome areas to, um, you know, design peace activities in our service delivery in, in interventions. So the power aspect is mm -hmm. ensuring that people influence the decisions that affect their lives. Mm -hmm. That's the way um, we, we we tend to frame it um, at, at the IRC. Um, I have to say that you know it's not easy. Um, you know, to do, especially when you have to turn around the proposal in 48 hours, right? So what time do you then have to go and engage with, um, you know, local communities to design the project? So again, this, the question of flexibility and um, adaptive management is very, very key. But, you know, we also have to be fair to donors as well. They also work within, you know, the constraints of the institutional frameworks that they, mm -hmm. have, they have to deal with. And this consideration of uh, power over versus uh, power with the population is also, I mean, it, it all boils down to also like the, the, the context analysis that we have mentioned uh, over and over again right now. And would um, th th this goes out to all of you, would you say that um, this could also create situations or, or, or um, have an insight into a situation where you say, okay, um, in this uh, specific context, we are not going to get involved in this specific um, area of, of, of peace or stabilization activities, no? Could you, could you imagine such a, such a um, situation? I can well, go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're right to go, you, you, please. Thank you. So we, um, we conducted a context and conflict analysis for Sudan and we realize uh, it is not possible uh, to uh, start intervention there. We um, already um, realized it is not possible due to the um, 
state of quo of the context itself, but also due to lack of resources, which we were um, having that time. Mm -hmm. So this is what happened to us. Um, but in every context where we are um, starting an intervention, if we do extensive context and conflict analysis, and we do also on regular basis in a participative way with the communities itself where we are planning to, to intervene or to implement. And from that perspective, also currently for the Iraqi context, um, we are looking how far it is realistic or feasible for us to really implement in some areas which were liberated from ISIS where the big destruction was taking place. Mm -hmm. We might say, okay, we cannot do that because lack of resources, because of the uh, unstable situation in the region, the security situation, which is very volatile and changing every day. So if we need to consider all this when we are planning our um, programs and activities. And what are the ways that the question of power kind of uh, enters your, your, your um, interventions and daily work? What would you say? Come again, sorry. Um, what would be the ways um, that, that, that the concept of power is entering um, your, your daily work or intervention, like um, grabbing on this uh, distinction that uh, Vale just made uh, um, of uh, power over people and power with people, like uh, working towards power with and maybe empowering people, if I understood you also right, Vale. Um, does this resonate with uh, your intervention in, in Erbil and uh, maybe also Kayu has something to uh, contribute to that? Oh yeah, I can, yeah, yeah, I can jump please. in. If, 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 yeah. uh, okay, so um, when it comes to empowerment, this is like basically the key strategic point of our organization mm -hmm. at Help Hip because empowerment is our main, because there is a lot of assumption with like, or con uh, consequences that are coming with uh, empowerment of individuals and systems, right? When you're talking about uh, individuals empowerment, uh, which also um, counts of course for marginalized groups, then um, we think that there is uh, the potential for, um, yeah, for more of a, for civil society, for a space for civil society in general, when people are empowered. You know, we're talking also, when it goes also into labor market, right? It comes to unions or any, anything, how people can organize themselves, right? Um, the more people organize themselves, the stronger they are when it comes to expressing their needs and their um, their demands uh, in front of the international community or the NGOs, but in the first place to their local administration, whoever that is. Yeah. Um, and I'm not I'm, I'm not so saying governments on purpose because it's a different thing. Um, then this, uh, so the stronger this uh, this movement can become, and, and I'm not talking when I'm saying movement, I'm not means mean something like the Arab Spring or something mm -hmm. like this, but more like a civil society movement where it's based also on uh, not on turning over or uh, flipping a government or something, right? But more, and then we have the chance that this is uh, getting into a direction where the participation of individuals is being uh, is improved in a in a country or regional context. And uh, with more participation, we think that um, situations can improve simply because more people are involved in expressing their needs. That's mm -hmm. basically the, a very basic concept. So, mm -hmm. but what I wanted to say regarding power also in the Western concept of uh, how we approach things, um, I think we, in history, we learned a lot about um, that things, and we learned this actually, everybody, I mean, everybody who's working in humanitarian con con uh, context is well traveled most of the time, you know, I've seen a few contexts and people and cultures, you know, not everything that counts for the West counts for everybody. Um, for example, when, if, if our first doctrine is that we want peace to be in place at locations, you know, there's, there are a lot of um, dictatorships in the world that actually don't have armed conflict going on right now. And, but this is nothing that we in the West support and we we don't like. And also this is very contradictory, contradictory to the empowerment concept. But at the end of the day, um, I see also some movement when it comes to uh, institutional actors or states that they are literally failing on the diplomatic floor, right? Mm. So, and I'm, I don't know if that's your role of the INGOs or NGOs in general to take over this work. To, to establish peace in places where 
where other interests are, or other groups are failing uh, miserably, miserably when it comes to negotiations. Mm. Uh, for example, do you think whatever I'm going to do, whatever the international NGO concert is doing in Syria um, on peace, even if we have like Kurds and Arabs living happily together and everything, do you think this is going to change something about Uh, natural gas supplies from the Gulf states, or is this going to change something about Rush Russian air force and naval bases at the Mediterranean? I don't think so. And there's major factors that are involved which are not going to change, and where we as NGOs or the humanitarian sector are way too small to tackle mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. It's not going to yeah. change. You've raised some very important and, and, and interesting um, uh, uh, points already. I would maybe now like to give the audience the chance uh, um, to, to come join us. This is why I uh, um, would like to invite uh, Darina again, my uh, colleague Darina, who has been monitoring the chat that it's going on quite lively, as uh, I don't see, but um, I've heard so far from, from, from our speakers. Please, um, Darina. Yes, indeed. Um, a big thank you to our um, participants online. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been a very lively chat. And also a big thanks to the panelists. You've been also very active in already answering some of the questions that were posed to you directly. So this said, I would just introduce some questions um, to the whole of the panel. And um, I have uh, several complexes here. Um, these are four complexes, at least, that I would like to introduce. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the first uh, complex, um, which is about localization, contextualization, and uh, leadership in this regard. Um, the questions have been posed by uh, Patrick Kamadi from Humedica, um, uh, Germany. And he is asking, to what extent do you think, dear panelists, um, Uh, that uh, INGOs, uh, national NGOs, and other civil organizations are working hard to embrace the nexus across their programs, uh, their different kinds of programs, and more import importantly, also across lo local governments. Uh, so, uh, to put it differently, um, in, in other words, how localized is the triple nexus? And I think this also points to another panel that we will have, uh, or another spotlight session that we will have tomorrow. And um, related to that uh, question on con contextualization also posed by Patrick, um, for him it is clear that we um, need more flexibility and nego negotiation um, to uh, make the triple nexus work in practice. So his question is, is it true that we will need a regionalized, a tailored, a more contextualized approach to the nexus rather than a global blanket um, mm -hmm. a triple nexus approach? Um, and finally, in this complex, um, I would like to introduce the question by Barbara and uh, Kriegsma. Um, and she thinks that uh, we need to speak about leadership in that regard as well, mm -hmm. um, especially at the field level, the triple nexus needs to be brought into uh, by a range of stakeholders, um, such as international, national NGOs, uh, but also donors, the UN system, governments, uh, and so on, across the development, humanitarian and peace building mm -hmm. uh, spectrum. So leadership uh, amongst those stakeholders is essential. Um, otherwise, uh, the strategic direction will be inexistent. So this is, uh, I think, enough food for thought for the first round. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think it relates uh, quite nicely to uh, our discussion, and um, I would uh, open the floor to uh, you to um, answer um, some of the questions posed in the chat. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I can um, start very quick. Or oh, while, oh, oh, Carsten. Oh, Carsten, please go. Please go ahead. Yeah. No, okay. Um, I, I think, I mean, just speaking uh, very shortly on, on the question of, of contextualization, I, I think that it is, it is extremely naive and dangerous from all of us to think that we can um, have a blanket approach that looks at, uh, at a wide policy framework that, that is set from, for the entire uh, humanitarian development and peace building act actors. I think that is extremely naive of us. I mean, we struggle in many countries where we work um, 
to actually implement a, a similar activity on on two ends of the same country. And and suddenly now we want to take all of this and and, and use it as a blanket approach and across all the conflicts. Uh, um, at least not even only conflict, but also in, 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 in countries where there's massive uh, development work and, and post-conflict areas. Like, how does this work when, when we fail to do this in a single country and, and many times also in, in a single city where the differences in that same city are so, uh, are so big that you need to tailor it to, to meet the needs of a particular population, even if living in, in the same city? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to add to that real quick um, regarding, yeah, I would even say also that uh, that um, an alternative way to a global blanket, when you're talking about a regional approach, this is also not detailed enough from my perspective. You know, it's like, I think Iraq is a very good example where you have, and the Raife, I, I hope will confirm, the, which is in uh, a few parts of the country that extremely diverse when it comes to different questions, you know, like how do you organize your family? You know, maybe you're Shia, maybe you're Sunni, maybe you don't care, you know, maybe you're Arab, maybe you're uh, Kurd, um, maybe you are religious, maybe not. Um, mechanisms of dispute, even non-statal mechanisms of dis dispute um, um, solving, right? When you have like a regional elder or somebody who is like saying, okay, I will solve these things like this. Do you think we can cover all that with the, even with a regional approach, even if you have like 10 villages with 12 different approaches, how to interpret law, you know, this is, uh, no, I don't think so. So, and this makes, this makes also evidence very complicated at the end of the day. And when you're thinking about um, institutional donors, especially the German ones, which are constantly struggling to establish um, evidence markers for different things. Um, then when it comes to the peace sector, uh, it's going to be even more complicated. And I don't even think that any data will be comparable. Mm -hmm. Vale, um, maybe you would like to speak to the question of leadership? Leadership, yes. Um, I, I really want to be fair to, um, you know, you know, to donors on the, on the one hand, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, we should never forget that, you know, most um, institutional um, government donors are responsible for spending taxpayers' money in their country. So there's always this tension between, you know, looking for that silver bullet, you know, the evidence of what works so that you can justify um, your spending um, to the taxpayer you need to, you know, make sure that you know you, you can demonstrate cost effectiveness mm -hmm. of what you're, you're, you're doing, which is which is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. The problem is, as um, Kirsten um, and Kayu as I've mentioned, is that it's it's practically impossible for you to generalize, right, and come up with what works. You know, so for us at the IRC, yes, we want to know what works, but under what condition is it working? And what are the mechanisms that makes it, you know, work? So we need to be a, a, a little bit more nuanced. So this global, even the regional stuff, I, I, I put, I responded to Patrick's um, question. It has to be on a case by case basis, you know, taking it to the lowest level, you know, of, you know, in, in the context, because as, as um, Kirsten said, a, an intervention can work in Northeast Uganda. That same intervention might fail in Northwest Uganda because mm -hmm. the context is very different. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very comfortable with this, you know, case by case um, um, basis. I want to pick up on mandates. There was a question on mandate, just, just quickly. I think we have to respect the mandate of various organizations. You know, there there are organizations that are purely set up to save lives, right? Mm -hmm. They're purely humanitarian. To then ask them to, you know, move into the development and peace building space, you know, is unfair unless they choose to change, you know, their mandate. And there are organizations that, you know, are multi-mandates, multi-mandated, and they can do those three, which is fine. So we just need to be very, very careful not to be asking everybody mm -hmm. to implement the triple nexus if it goes mm -hmm. way outside their mandate, because their mandate determines the type of staff and the skill sets they hire for. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, um, uh, Vali. Um, maybe um, there are more questions, uh, and that in the next round we might start with um, Raife to answer the questions. My colleague, Darina. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I have uh, at least three more complexes of okay. questions, so I hope we can introduce them all because uh, there has been some very interesting points. So the next complex is more about competition, overfunding, and how to um, make collaboration work. Mm -hmm. So a question introduced by Matthias uh, from FCA um, is that, well, programmatically, um, we all should collaborate um, with having, first and foremost, the rights uh, holders in our mind, mm -hmm. um, but um, as uh, he is not sure about uh, whether uh, this existing system that we have uh, and the competition uh, for resources uh, that exists um, in practice uh, enables such a collaboration. So uh, he is also putting forward another um, solution, um, which could be consortia. Could consortia be maybe a helpful way to forward um, uh, and foster this collaboration? Or uh, does it just create another bureaucracy mo monster? Um, very interesting question. And very interestingly, uh, Martin Menger from the German Federal Foreign Office um, also introduced a related question. He is asking, how um, can we move to, towards a nexus approach that builds on partnerships among uh, NGOs and governments and all the stakeholders involved in the different fields? And that actually enc encourages um, comparative advantages of all these different stakeholders and does not require all actors to build capacities and en engage in all three dimensions of mm -hmm. the nexus. So with that, I would hand over to you back. Okay, um, thank you, Darina. Um, I think those questions are also very uh, eminent for, for, for our discussion, especially the latter one that is something that we have um, encountered a lot, that a lot of uh, organizations uh, were kind of terrified to having to turn into triple triple mandate organizations now, so they have to do everything. Um, um, and I think um, it is very, very um, um, important to um, also get the house a little bit in order with regard to that. Um, Raife, would you like to start uh, um, with referring to uh, the questions um, mentioned in the second round of chats, uh, referring to uh, consortia and um, the Nexus approach uh, and um, capacities in other organizations as well? Sure. I think one thing that we have to consider um, is maybe um, that roles and responsibilities within the triple nexus of the actors um, itself are not really clarified. Um, um, the, the, yeah, the, the fields are blurring. It is, uh, there are no maybe clear distinctions. Maybe we have to first work on that. Um, I personally don't have uh, the solution for that, but I think how far we can coordinate, collaborate with each other, with each other is, um, of course, maybe, um, yeah, yeah. At the end, I mean, we are working in the same context. We, uh, if it comes to the German funding, we have it nearly, I mean, um, the funding is from Germany, for example, and the resources are um, that we are sharing, I think we could start slowly sharing our resources in general. So that would be a way forward uh, from my own perspective. Um, as I said before, if it's come to the conflict sensitive planning mm -hmm. and programming, uh, we could share our resources. And how far a consortium could um, help us to come together or to collaborate and coordinate more, it does work if you, if you look into the civil peace programming. We are um, nine partners in the consortium itself. We do share um, our outputs and as well our resources. Um, so there is a extensive exchange among the uh, consortium members. It's a way, I think. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, on the other way, I think it's really maybe, first of all, clarifying roles and responsibilities. This will be, from my perspective, very important to consider. Okay, thank you, Raife. Any other takes on that from your, from our panel? 
Um, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so, you know, on, on competition for funding versus collaboration, I mean, that's a fantastic question because on the one hand, they're asking us to collaborate, but the reality is we're also in competition with each other. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with competition, right? You know, as long as it's a healthy one. Um, I, I think that, you know, donors can, you know, set the parameters. They can do three things. One is, you, we, you can encourage collaboration by creating the incentive structures in your call for proposals, for example, that you know forces people to collaborate. So that's one. And two, I think consortiums have to include local organizations, not four or five international NGOs, right? Local organizations as equal partners, mm -hmm. not just subcontractors. Yeah, you know, that's very, very um, I I important. And, and the third piece is it also needs to meaningfully engage local authorities, local institutions, you know, in, in the places um, we work in and, you know, engage what, you know, the duty bearers, people who are actually responsible for providing those services. Now, with the caveats, where they are legitimate, because if they are illegitimate, then there's a problem. As long as there's legitimacy of that local authority in the eyes of the people, they should be engaged. So local authorities, local partners, and donors setting the parameters for collaboration. Uh, and I think that, that will work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe with regard to time, I would ask Darina to uh, maybe pick your favorite uh, um, um, question from uh, the chat uh, that I will then um, um, get back to the, the, to the um, speakers. Um, go ahead, please. Yeah, I have uh, two very interesting points, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, one is, um, well, the triple nexus uh, is uh, just one approach that we have, just one nexus that we have. We're also talking about the climate security nexus, mm -hmm. for example. So um, how does the triple nexus go in hand in hand with other nexus, uh, like the climate nexus, gender gaps, etc.? That mm -hmm. will be my first uh, question I would like to uh, give to the panel. And the second one is about humanitarian principles. Um, so peace is obviously also a political process. Um, so have the panelists come across uh, moments of contradiction with humanitarian principles, etc. Um, for example, the uh, principle of neutrality and independence. And uh, independence is also highlighted uh, uh, again in another question. Um, uh, that is uh, posed by Christopher Lieden, um, who is asking how do we avoid that the integration of the humanitarian action with peace and development uh, initiatives can undermine the independence and the access of humanitarian mm -hmm. actors. Mm -hmm. So with that last complex, I'd hand back over back to you. Yes, um, thank you very much, Darina, for this. Um, Carsten. <laughs> Would you uh, mind talking about the complexities of the humanitarian principles in your daily work or in, in the work of your organization, particularly? Thank you, Andrea. I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, the the hear internet you. seems Loudly. to be having any problems. OK. Uh, I, I think, I mean, it, it's an interesting reflection uh, from, from Christopher that I saw as well in the chat. The, the part of the reason, and in my introduction, I spoke about this as well, is is what is at risk, what is at stake if, if we are suddenly bringing all these different apples into the same basket? Um, and, and, and how then do we ensure that, in, in a sense, each apple, um, and here speaking about humanitarian principles in, in, um, in actual fact, how do we ensure that we continue to protect them when the, the way of working of, of, of the nexus is exactly that, you know, to, to, to put the state at the driving seat, to, to put um, 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 the, the, the policy framework at the driving seat and let it determine how we, uh, how we implement our activities. So f for me, there's a, there's a dichotomy here and I, I don't see how we can resolve this. I don't see how we can continue to to want to ensure that humanitarian principles are respected as tools that enable us uh, to reach people in need of assistance. Um, and at the same time, still then um, wearing the cap of, of, of development and peace building. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, 
the the impact is that um, there is a very great risk of of dilution of humanitarian principles, and at the end of the day, we we, we stand to lose much more of these um, tools that we continue to have and, and that I had threat on a day-to-day -day basis as I was talking about shrinking humanitarian space mm -hmm. earlier on. So I, I honestly don't see how you can resolve this, um, um, this contradiction. Mm -hmm. Vale, um, your organization is implementing quite hands-on peace projects. Um, um, how do you avoid um, endangering the humanitarian principles? Okay, so... <laughs> Um, at, at the risk of saying something, you know, quite controversial here, okay. you know, I think the way, the best way for you to implement humanitarian principles is first of all, understanding the context in which you're working in. Because if you don't understand the context, you might think you're being neutral or you're being impartial, but because of your blind spots, you're actually do, doing more, more harm than good, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen situations where, you know, organizations tend to treat everyone as beneficiaries, as clients, but even within that group, you do have power holders, right, that control things. If you don't understand that, you might actually think that you are being neutral, you know, normatively, but in actual practice, you're not. You're actually um, causing more harm. I want to go back to something that... We, it, it, there is a tension that I see, and it goes back to the example that Kirsten was giving about Nigeria, which is the country I'm, I'm, I'm from. There's a tension between state sovereignty and humanitarian principles, clearly, right? Where the state is accusing NGOs, I mean, we were also accused in Northeast Nigeria, you know, of everybody was actually accused of supporting the insurgents because we wanted to provide services to people in um, affected areas. And humanitarian actors are also saying, you know, we're talking about humanitarian principles, we're neutral, which is all good. But I think that that's not helpful because you have the government on one side that has the right to, you know, <laughs> um, protect the integrity of its, of its borders. Then you have humanitarians going trying to save lives. There needs to be dialogue between um, the two. I, I give an example which I would like to share here during our prep last week. I mean, as a Nigerian organization, can I just fly into the south of France where there's a flood and, you know, say based on humanitarian principles, you know, the French government, I don't need to coordinate with them. I just want to save lives. Can I do that? Of course not. Right. So what makes us think, you know, as Western based organizations, we should have, you know, the right to do that in other people's countries as well by saying, you know, humanitarian principles. Yes, those principles are the right thing to do, but we also have to understand the political dynamics in the places that we're working with for those principles to actually work and be effective. Okay, thank you, Vale. Um, Kayu, Raifa, uh, please uh, go ahead, but in the interest of time, that because we are already running uh, over time a little bit, uh, be brief and concise, we will then uh, finish with a uh, last round of very short uh, um, comments and points that uh, everyone wants to raise. Please, um, Raife, are you with us? I cannot see you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, will uh, I will say that um, I actually, in Iraq itself, I didn't experience any challenge in terms of humanitarian principles. Okay. So, um, uh, from my own perspective, some if if we take some contexts like Mali, um, there might be um, a danger or risk um, where the humanitarian principles being overruled. Uh, but here in Iraq itself, uh, we actually experienced. Uh, positive, um, more positive way when some humanitarian um, organizations started implementing. Um, so we didn't come across with any challenges in this direction. So I personally think um, it's not actually, yeah, it, it depends always on the context where we are acting and, um, um, and we need to consider the context um, which might also, yeah, endanger the principle itself. Thank you. Caillou? Yeah, I think that um, that there is no per se um, problem with uh, 
bringing these two factors together. It really depends, as Reifel just said, it really depends on every individual factor and the individual community and the, every even every individual person. You know, this is what we were actually saying here in this panel, that it's um, mm -hmm. that uh, there is no basic or general or holistic generalistic concepts that we can actually apply because we have to look into every single detail of every uh, concept or every region every family so um but what i certainly think is so the more you move away from a detailed approach like a like a focused uh, fine approach the more you're getting into trouble right the more you're getting into a situation where like if you because the bigger you are the more you get with uh, mm -hmm. the more actors are being involved and the more the powerful actors are being involved right let's talk the state or whoever or administration so if those people are getting involved you already get in trouble with the human term principles automatically mm -hmm. and um i think this is why individual small solutions sh should be relevant locally led solutions should be relevant because then you're evading the problem with uh dancing with the big kids. I think that's the problem. Okay. So, um, thank you so much. I mean, I, wow, I really enjoyed myself uh, again in this uh, uh, particular round of, uh, with this particular round of speakers. Um, um, so, I think what we have learned so far is, uh, it kind of uh, can be uh, boiled down to, to three things. As I have understood them, Context analysis goes before everything else, before even thinking about um, um, programming and such. Um, you have to know your place and your limits as an organization. This is what uh, the th second thing uh, I, I, I understood. And plus, uh, you have to get your own house in order before uh, trying to uh, dance with the big kids or to cite uh, Caillou. I would now uh, invite the four of you for very brief one or two sentences, your last statement uh, regarding what you have uh, uh, heard and learned and uh, um, um, valued in this discussion um, of the past 90 minutes. Please, um, Carsten, maybe you want to start. Thanks, Sandra. It, it has been an interesting uh, discussion, and, uh, and and I think for me the, the, the biggest take uh, takeaway um, is is exactly that it is about context analysis, and it is about us tailoring. Um, our interventions to meet the needs of the people that we're trying to bring assistance. And so I think that brings us further away from uh, trying to, to, to implement activities in order to achieve the certain policy framework, but it actually forces us to look at the power issue as well and, and how do we put communities um, um, at the center of what we do in order to respect their dignity. Thank you so much uh, to everyone. Thank you, Carsten. Raifel, maybe you want to go next? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, it was a pleasure to join this session, also from Erbil. Um, well, I think um, also my, I personally learned a lot um, uh, talking to the other colleagues here. Um, yeah, I think we, we can uh, work hand in hand. All the actors can collaborate and coordinate more. Um, there are ways, and um, let's start with basics. Uh, with minimum standards um, like um, yeah, conflict sensitive planning and uh, programming, especially for organizations which are entering peace building, um, yeah, peace building uh, measures or activities. Um, and there, I think also let's um, work hand in hand and coordinate, collaborate more in strengthening the national and local capacities here. This is what I already mentioned before, but I think it's very much important to highlight again. Thank you. Thank you, Raifa. Who wants to go next? Yeah, I always like Wallis points, so maybe Wallis going last because he's always making good points. So I will uh, then go now. Thank you so much. Uh, so um, I would say I learned very much that there is there is um, there is more. There's something beyond the humanitarian and development uh, programming, right? I knew this before, but I wanted. I, I learned very much how detailed this is and how far this goes. And I'm really looking forward to um, to think and think about and conceptualize how we do mainstreaming of um, peace-sensitive uh, or conflict-sensitive uh, approaches more, maybe may, maybe more in a structuralized manner. And but uh, I think we all agree that uh, that there are still things bigger than us and then the whole humanitarian sector or um, which which direct where things are going and it doesn't matter what we're going to do on the ground if these things on the political level are not going to change mm -hmm. and that's basically thank you vale the floor is yours for 
Yeah, Hello. thank you. Thanks, um, Andrea, and thanks to you know all the other panelists. Um, I really also enjoyed this and um, le le learned a lot from from everyone. So for me, I will I will say four things. W one is let's think global as we are now, but let's act local, right? Because that's where that change happens. And the second thing is let's also as we're acting locally, let's also focus on impact and outcomes mm -hmm. for real people. Now, if the HDP um, enables us to reach those outcomes, fine. But the focus should be on the outcomes, not just the HDP uh, itself, because that's a means to, to an end. And I'll say, like everyone has said, context matters. You know, it's central, it's foundational. And the final thing I would like to say is, you know, tying this back to the whole debate in aid, you know, mm -hmm. in, you know, decolonizing aid, being you know anti-racist in, in in the sector, is that local ownership matters, right? We will not succeed if the processes and the projects we're implementing is not owned by the people in those communities. So local ownership matters, you know. That's you know, okay. Context matters. Local ownership matters. Let's think global, act local, and let's focus on outcomes. Thank you so much, Vali, also for putting uh, um, the local context uh, first and last within this uh, session. Um, again, my heart, very heartfelt thank you to all of you amazing speakers. I enjoyed myself a lot. I think um, all the other people uh, in the chat have also enjoyed uh, uh, your uh, great expert uh, expertise and input. Um, we will now um, go on a break that kind of boiled down to a 15 to 20 minutes break to then resume uh, with uh, the next panel session, which is us. We are also looking forward very much to, which uh, is going to dive into the question of um, what about peace and what is this actually, the, the, the P in the triangle. Um, stay tuned. It will be very interesting. And also, um, I would invite all of you speakers now to uh, uh, join the discussion uh, of the next panel session. Uh, see you back here very soon. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.